Anyway, that was a great combo about going global. Well, next we're going to dig into the ethics and uh, practices around responsible lending and the industry's future. How fintechs are leading the way to discuss and debate this. We're, please welcome to the stage Richard Shanahan from TikTok with a C. Uh, he's not going to be doing short memes, I don't think. Uh, Tim Boskett from Investec Yodley and Justin Joff from Flux Finance. To lead this discussion, our moderator is Jackie Duncan from Stone and Chalk. Welcome all to the stage. Well, there he is. Exit stage left. Entrance stage left. All right, guys, over to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, one second here. So I thought it was kind of funny that they picked the Irish moderator for this because responsible lending uh, maybe don't compute in my head, you know, <laughs> um, which is really, I thought it was kind of funny. So obviously those two words, yeah, they don't make a lot of sense when you grew up in the GFC and saw everything kind of crash. So it's, it's definitely a bit ironic. But I'm joined here by three amazing um, fintech startups. And so I'm going to get you guys to introduce yourself in a second. But for those of you who I don't know, I see some friendly faces. But for those of you I don't know, my name is Jackie Duncan. And I'm the head of relationship management for Stone & Chalk in Sydney. And so if you don't know who Stone & Chalk are, we are the largest innovation community in Australia. So we're a not-for-profit. And we were also founded in fintech back in 2015. We have since expanded into more emerging tech sectors, but we are very strong in fintech, with about 70% of our residents in Sydney actually within that sector. And I'm very pleased to say that TikTok and both um, uh, Investnet and Yodley are actually residents with us in, in, um, in Stone and Chalk, and maybe we'll get flux someday, so we'll see about that. Okay, so I'm gonna have Tim, do you wanna introduce yourself and a little bit about Investnet Yodley? Thanks, Jackie. Um, Tim Poskick, Country Manager for Investment Yodley, based in Sydney. Run the operations for the organisation across Australia and New Zealand. It goes from go-to-market strategy and how we bridge across the region and also expand into Southeast Asia. Um, for those who don't know, Investnet Yodley, one of the largest global data aggregation analytics platform. Um, head office is in San Francisco in the US and we power a number of leading fintechs both locally and globally. Um, many of you would have seen them today. TikTok is one of those organizations as well. Um, and, work, and we're also under CDR. We were accredited in 2021. So our open banking solution is now live and really getting behind the CDR regime and really trying to power that further into the ecosystem. Richard. Thanks, Jackie. Hi, Richard Shanahan. I'm Chief Product and Data Officer from TikTok. TikTok with a C, as we said, this is the TikTok is a digital home loan platform. Um, I've been with TikTok for since five years, or since 2017, the heady days of our launch to the startup through to scale up. Um, we launched initially with a retail proposition, a B2C, which is based around faster, smarter, simple, simpler home lending. And we've evolved that proposition to a platform proposition now. And we've, we service brands for a launching their own home loan proposition or solving for discrete parts of the decisioning and origination journey. Amazing. Justin. Hi, my name's Justin. I'm one of the co-founders of Flux Finance. Uh, Flux is a financial wellbeing platform that helps over 300,000 Australians. We combine uh, gamification content, educational content that is, and a whole lot of data to help people become more financially uh, well and, and less stressed. And uh, we've got a daily business news podcast called What the Flux and a daily newsletter that goes out to over 35,000 people. That's awesome. I actually have your newsletter. I get your EDM and it's honestly really good. If you don't receive it, I would recommend that you subscribe. It's, it's really, really good. It's very informative. Okay, so to kick off, I gave you a taster of what I think responsible lending is. It's basically don't bring a country to its knees. But I would love to know what you guys define responsible lending as, and maybe from your own perspectives, but as well as your companies. Tim? Sure, thanks. Um, I mean, from my own personal perspective, it's ultimately about responding lending to individuals or organizations, but with full transparency throughout that process. So, you know, you often hear stories when individuals and organizations have not had full, clear understanding of the commitment they're getting into um, and also the full terms of that agreement. So I think ultimately it's providing full transparency to 
the end customer being business or consumer about what that is. Um, I think if you look throughout you know, the process today, people have been through mortgage applications, personal loan applications, and that full process is disjointed in part. And I think how from Australian obligations to help consumers to provide strict obligations around that. I think helps businesses, but also consumers. And I think we've got somewhere to go in terms of helping them with better data and quality, but then also making it more efficient and automated without providing a very slow process. Personally, I went through that process myself to get a mortgage a few months ago, and I think I uploaded about 28 PDF documents. So I think, I didn't use TikTok, by the way, so I should have done so if you, you, know, you can tell Anthony that. But, um, but I think um, there's clearly a long way to go in the process, and I think, yeah. Yeah, and that's just one type alone, right? So, um, Richard, what's your definition of responsible lending? Okay, I'm going to go really simple. I'm going to say uh, responsible lending in the true sense is understanding your customer's true capacity to borrow. Now, there's a lot in that, right? But, you know, TikTok, we, we really love responsible lending. You know, we love it so much we build a platform and a business around it. Um, and we take it really seriously. It's a societal obligation in the true sense of making sure that people are living within their means and borrowing within their means. And if you look at, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we all do, the APRA quarterly banking statistics, there's some really interesting numbers that come out in there. Um, what we can see in last quarter, I think really nearly 25% of all deals and loans that were settled had a debt to income ratio of over six. That means for every dollar you earn, you owe six. That's quite scary, right? So what's gonna happen over the next year and 12 months, as you heard some of the other speakers talk about, there's a big chunk of fixed rate home loans that are gonna roll off and these people have borrowed these at maybe like a 189, a cheap rate, hot deal, but they're gonna find they're gonna to roll to a higher rate. Now their capacity to borrow and service that loan is gonna be really eroded. Their ability to live is gonna be really eroded. So we see responsible lending as a way to solve that. Now, traditionally, it's been too hard. We'll get to it, and then we heard that in the Royal Commission. Um, but you know, it doesn't have to be, and we're gonna talk about that today, and we'll unpick it a little bit. Um, you just need a design for responsible lending and, and what your customer needs from the outset. That's really good. And Justin, what about you? I'm gonna take a bit of a different approach to responsible lending. Please do. So, I mean, obviously we know the minimum standards of responsible lending that ASIC set, and that's totally, you know, fine. Um, but really, when you think about the minimum standards uh, in, in lending, as opposed to the minimum standards across, you know, in, in, in criminal law, you think of minimum standards of not stealing. It doesn't teach you how to be a good person. It just tells you you can't steal. So I think there's a big difference between responsible lending and lending responsibly. So I think in terms of lending responsibly, what the responsibility should be is as a key part of education around this process. I mean, we know from our community of hundreds of thousands of Australians that this is a really, really significant milestone in their lives when they take out their first home loan or even car loan. Uh, and it's a really scary process that a lot of people don't know or understand what that process looks like. So I think it's uh, incumbent on all lenders to actually be responsible by taking consumers through a journey. And that journey starts pre-loan, where they can understand what they need to provide in order to be... Uh, you know, accepted as, uh, as part of that uh, credit decisioning. It's during the loan to encourage people to pay down their loan faster and get out of debt as soon as they can. And even post-loan, it includes uh, how do we get people back on track or recover so they can focus on their next major milestone in their lives. And I think, you know, it goes to the extent of either, of even when someone gets rejected from a loan, how do you tell them how they can improve for next time? Yeah, I love that. And actually, that leads us really nicely into our next question. So we're going to talk about, you know, the ins and outs of lending in a moment. But let's talk about that journey prior to even getting access to funding. Um, how can we better consumer education, financial literacy, and also give choice um, to improve financial health? And maybe we'll continue. Do you want to continue? Because sure. you're on a roll there. I love it. <laughs> sure. So... Uh I mean, just for context for everyone, what we know is one in two Australians struggle with basic financial literacy. Um, that's part of the, the HILDA report that the Melbourne Institute does uh, every couple of years. Uh, and that impacts on all parts of their lives, whether that's um, taking out a credit product, whether that's investing, whether that's just understanding how to do some basic budgeting. So we know, uh, especially from our community as well, that right now financial stress is at its highest levels. It's been forever, or at least since we've been recording it. 
And uh, I mean, we all know that the cost of living is rising, inflation is rising, and the uncertainty around our economy is really, really scary. So for a lot of people, it's really important that they're positioned at a place where they understand the process that they go in before they apply for a loan. And you know, it's not just everyday consumers, it's also employees as well. We know that 61% um, of employees say that financial stress is their number one cause of stress. So making sure that they can be more productive in the workplace, uh, retained in their workforce as well, also contributes towards responsible lending because if you don't have a job, it's often very hard to get a mortgage. So uh, I think it's really important that this journey starts way before that point in time decision, which is currently at the point in which you apply for a loan. Yeah, and I mean like, you know, in school you learn algebra and different kind of math. It's like, actually, I don't, I don't need this. I'd like to prefer to actually maybe how to get a loan and what that looks like and how to run my day-to-day -day financials. It's probably more valuable. And you, you mentioned, um, you know, it might be hard to, to obviously get a loan if you don't have a job. And that kind of also opens the door to accessibility and inclusivity of lending. So let's talk a little bit about that. And maybe, Richard, you can speak to this because I know TikTok do a good job of this. Yeah, so I was just continuing on that thread. It's, you know, the TikTok mission since day dot has been about demystify lending, right? It is about understanding your financial health, to Justin's point, um, and know when you're ready to apply. The purpose of that is to make sure that, you know, it doesn't have to be this horrible, invasive, intrusive, anxiety-laden experience getting a home loan, you know, uploading 28 documents, it takes a long time. <laughs> so much so that you have this PTSD effect that you don't want to apply for a home loan for another six years, and then you're locked into a 5.1% you know, rate and become a mortgage prisoner. It doesn't have to be that way. So you know, TikTok and you know, what we see with other fintechs out there today is we, there's a real commitment to demystifying lending, making sure you know when you're ready, understand your financial health, and ultimately that's going to empower the consumer. Yeah, and I think, you know, like getting a mortgage, and I know we're specifically just talking about mortgage shares, but everyone has a right to a home, right? So, you know, it's, there's a lot of hoops kind of to jump through, and I think you do a good job of kind of actually demystifying that and I know that there's a lot of speed there as well which is really cool. I did the 28 million documents as well recently so I, I feel that pain and actually I told Richard he was like it doesn't have to be like that. <laughs> so I, I, I hear you. Um, do you want to touch on the inclusivity piece? Inclusivity, you know, it is a tricky thing because lending inherently, I don't want to shock anyone here, it is biased, right? You need a job, you need an income. Um, but you know the, the inclusivity piece is really it's about understanding your financial health. You know, and if you use really plain language, really accessible nurture sequences and journeys and content that are easy to consume, so you can build up a picture of your financial health, of, you're gonna buy, you, you know, you'll feel included in the ecosystem of lending over time. But it is a, it is a journey, right? And yeah. financial com commission for understanding financial health is really important for Australia. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And I'd also add there is, Understand your financial health before you go in for the loan. So I think, you know, people who have maybe it's their first credit experience or they might go through that process, but unless they're clear about where they are, do they know their credit score, have this in their live transaction banking data, until they go through that process, they might not know where, they where their credit score sits. They might not know mm -hmm. where their live, you know, transactional data. And, you know, at Investnet Yodley, we power a number of leading PFM wellness solutions. You know, one of those is We Money, we announced this, this year recently, where, you know, powering them with an live open banking solution. And ultimately, the view there is to help those consumers to get that better loan and better facility because they may be, you know, overpaying that facility. They may be on that 5.3% loan um, and not have an understanding of that. So I think it's, it's not just a one-off thing. It's an ongoing awareness. And I think, you know, Australia, if you look at the global perspective and the previous session is probably very high financial literacy compared to other parts across the world. And I think has a good understanding of that, but there's still way to go. Yeah. And I mean, you touched on umpa banking, like obviously it's all about choice, right? That's the whole point is that you should have choice. Exactly. I mean, that's the full, you know, ecosystem driven, you know, objective is to have the choice. Obviously, where the, you know, the success is today is, is another story. But I think um, ultimately to provide the consumer ownership of their own data to have a better choice to you have choice on a better loan and better facility, is it right? And you go back to the question of what is responsible lending, it's ultimately to allow the consumer to control their own data, to have a better decision on what they, they want. They may actually only want a shorter term facility as opposed to longer, you know, a 30 year mortgage, for example. Yeah, great. So it leads us into, um, you know, FinTech's doing an amazing job in, in, in what I'm about to ask next. So how can data and automation improve responsible lending? So the obvious things are speed and accuracy. 
But what about decisioning customer service or customer retention, for example? Um, how does your company use data and automation for those reasons? Richard, we'll kick it off with you. I'll, um, I'll go there. Thanks, Jackie. So, you know, it, that is really the crux for how you solve for responsible lending. Data and automation is key. So if you think about lending decisioning, like when you go to apply for your home loan or you know, whatever that journey looks like, there's really four key questions you're trying to answer. You know, is that property okay? Are you who you say you are? Is your credit record okay? And can you afford it? Right? So those four key questions, but each one of those can be underpinned by data and automation. If you take a, you know, a, a consent, a collect, and a rich and a decision approach to each of those stages, working you know, with partners like Yodley, right, you can then embed that automation and you can embed a really clear, accurate picture of financial position of your customer. And what you'll find then is you can then put your, your people, your contact center agents, your home loan credit assessors, in the middle of the automation, a true human in a loop approach. And they can actually start having really meaningful conversations with the customers, which is actually really important, rather than doing menial tasks. But you have, you know, with data automation, you're going to embed quality understanding of financial position and you're going to free your people up to do high value work. I think there's a, a massive advantage to having that human element for sure. And you know, you can get let the let the computer do all of the data crunching and then put the the humans at the face of your business. It's really cool. It's really good. Tim? I think, I mean, from my personal perspective and from Yodley, I think it's automation, exactly what Richard said. You know, the, the more data points you take in, be that credit bureau data, be it bank statements data, whatever that data points is, will ultimately assess that process. Not only are you saying yes quicker, you're saying no quicker to help that end consumer be getting the right back to respond to lender the objective for them. I think also there's probably a need for automation on the actual the lending platform. So obviously, you know, you have your own platform, but there's other organizations who assist with the automation. So I think um, if you look, you know, a few years ago and even still today, many large organizations are still not doing that today. They're still not implementing decisioning sessions. They're still not having, you know, automation, which ultimately would speed that process up. So I still think today there's organizations who are, you know, large tier, tier lenders that are still not doing that today. So I think it's important that um, that will only speed up the, the better adoption and then ultimately give the better response to the consumer, which and is also not just from the outset, it's probably retention as well. So Tim is a customer, but actually how do I continue Tim to be a customer? How do I continue to use data better from an ongoing basis to keep you know, alerts on his profile? He, you know, his credit profile might change, then how can I offer him a, a new facility throughout that process? So I don't think it's just necessarily from the get-go. The origination is also origination, but then ongoing to keep that customer more engaged and value throughout the sort of value chain. Justin, what would you like to add? So I think obviously the whole lending uh, system has changed significantly, significantly over the last five to 10 years. And it's amazing that we now see instant decisioning or close to instant decisioning on home loans and a whole range of different uh, lending products. I think with instant decisioning often comes a yes or no response, which is binary. And for so many people, that means that they actually if they are rejected from a, a lending product, they don't know why. And that can be a really frustrating experience for a lot of people. So, I mean, we, we hear from a lot of our consumers and users of the app that they don't actually understand why or how they can improve their position. But what we do know is everyone wants to improve. And so I think there are three key steps to actually helping people improve on their financial journey so that they can become more accepted or fit within the credit decisioning of a particular lender. The first is around uh, knowledge and building education so that people can consume really snappy, engaging and entertaining content that they can consume and understand how they can improve. The second is around building really strong habits, so incentivizing people to adopt those positive habits, often through gamification, so that they can drive forward in their goal, whatever that might be. And for us, what we found, which is really interesting, is that the third key pillar is around community and building a community of people that are actually in the same position so that you can then speak to others who are like-minded in a safe space where they've already had lived experiences and can learn from those experiences as well. So that then wherever they're at on their money journey, they can then hopefully achieve that yes in the future if it's originally a no. And I think, you know, when we say being a good lender or a progressive lender, it's not just about um, saying no and, and giving reasons. It's actually good business because being transparent leads to higher loyalty, greater trust, and often will 
you know, lead to um, more financially engaged consumers, which lead to a high, lower probability of actually defaulting later on as well. Okay, thank you. And, you know, this space, fintech has always, you know, in the last, I suppose, 10 years, you know, big co corporates and government and regulators have been like, okay, what, what can we do here in Australia to, to facilitate this? How can they make this easier um, to actually provide access to lending? What can they do? Yeah, sure. I mean, from my perspective, it's purely around CDR. So ultimately, higher adoption and utilization across the CDR ecosystem and removing and reducing barriers to entry will allow more organizations to get a broadness use of data. So we've obviously seen that recently with the you know, the um, agency model under CDR representative, which realistically allows a lot more, I think we have now 36 or 38 um, recipients utilizing that data set. That's still very small, um, so I think that's still got a long way to go. Um, I think that will do you know great part in terms of having a full comp complete picture, both with CDR and non-CDR data. Um, that's probably the main thing that we've been lobbying very hard with the government on and given our view around how CDR can broader help the ecosystem. But if you're looking at an uh, individual's broader financial picture, it's not just the bank account, it's not just, it's also their broader financial position. So what's their stock savings, what's their in their superannuation account, so actually how is that individual position? So I still think Today, from utilizing the data, you know, under CDR is going to be a, a blended model, a hybrid solution from our perspective, and how we then do that. That's probably the main key focus from our side. Yeah, I think fundamentally, we just want to talk. We want to be able to engage really re regularly and reliably with government and politicians um, because we, we want to build the future of lending in Australia together. You know, there's a lot of fintechs out there with some amazing ideas, and you've heard from a lot of them today and tomorrow. Um, we need more of an audience. It doesn't have to be regulator to incumbent, regulator to incumbent, big lender. It needs to be more open dialogue. Now, there is some amazing stuff happening. You know, consumer data right is the bee's knees and it will be transformative for Australia and hopefully globally as well. And I think, you know, the roadmap for CDR is really exciting too. You know, you heard action initiation. That is really, really important. And, open, and opening up other sectors is really, really critical. Now, I think tactically there's some stuff that uh, the regulators can do over the next 12 to 24 months, uh, particularly around mortgage portability. You know, I'd love to have a beautiful technical solution, you know, hit this, refinance today, port your mortgage, your home loan across, get a better rate. But what we find today is when you try to refinance, the incumbent gets a say in it. And that's where, you know, you, the cashback comes in. You know, that is, it's too late in the game. If you really cared about the customer and you're a responsible lender, that might not be the place you want to do it. So I think we need to look at a way that you can free up the movement of home loans through the economy. Hmm. Justin. I think uh, these two are probably in a better position to speak from a lending perspective. But again, from a consumer perspective, I think the biggest, uh, biggest progression that will be consumer data rights, but also in particular, allowing consumers to have po uh, choice portability, and also making sure that they have the right information in front of them to make the best decisions. Often consumers are, are misled by certain pieces of information or they might not actually know what's right or wrong. So uh, enabling people to have a more, I guess, broader knowledge base and also um, helping them actually on that journey uh, will, I think, be a, a key element to it. I'd also add that if you think about the end consumer, they really don't care what open banking is or CDR is. What do they care about? They care about getting a better loan, be it a mortgage with another lender or cheaper credit cards. So I think at the end of the day, it's, it's ensuring that the consumer has a better choice in the solution that they're selecting and that they get more awareness on where the use of their own data and what it can do. So I think, you know, well, it's great. There's other sections on the roadmap, but I think we really have to nail it down on what we've done so far and to get, you know, higher adoption throughout the ecosystem before we sort of, you know, run it hard at other, other segments straight away. Cool, so access to information and choice, that's, the, that's it. Um, and just, we'll go to a Q&A um, maybe, but maybe one sentence. What's next for um, Investnet Yodley? Um, what's next? I mean, this is the year obviously for you know, more adoption and focus around open banking. We've got our recent um, credit accelerator solution, which we're working with a number of lenders across the both mortgage and non-mortgage space. So that's really a key focus for us. And then also branching out into new regions across the APAC area. Exciting. What about TikTok? 
Um, busy as always, I think we've got some pretty exciting changes to our proposition for our retail brand. Uh, we're working in partnership with AFG, which a lot of people probably would have seen, um, as a way we can help more of our customers. Um, we also have a couple of um, very large brands looking to go live with a home loan proposition in the next six months, so watch this space. Awesome. What about Flux? Uh, we've got a pretty big vision that we want to build the most financially responsible and educated generation that's ever lived. So how do you do that? you create a whole lot of gamification, amazing content, and a community, as I mentioned, to really get people together and passionate about financial education. And I think when you look 10 years ago, if people would speak about mental health and well-being, you couldn't imagine anything that would incentivize people to meditate for five or 10 minutes a day. And then Calm and Headspace came along, and it changed the game around mental well-being. We see there's a huge opportunity within financial well-being to change the, the game, and uh, Flux is gonna be at the forefront of that. That's so exciting, guys. It's going to be good. Does anyone have any questions? Everyone's like, we know, we have loans, we know. <laughs> There's one here in the front. Hi, um, I'm, I run a digital lending company, right? So one of the issues that I face or my team face is we wouldn't know these customers actually has loan with other players out there. Right? So do you think there's a possibility of having a centralized data uh, for the uh, players to know the customers, whether or not how's the paying behavior, whether they fall, all these things? Do we have or should we have? No, should we have, and if yes, is how? So the, you know, the credit bureau really performs a lot of that function today. So you know, um, all lenders and, and anyone who holds information is required to report. And under the comprehensive credit reporting scheme, the credit bureaus hold that information today. Um, so you can access that under you know, a certain level of accreditation. On the Flux app as well? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but most of the players doesn't share it with credit bureau. That's a, that's a problem, could, right? Could it be done better? That's, yes, very interesting opportunities. And I think CDR is really the enabler. That's a general purpose technology, which is gonna really enable some new ways of thinking about that. Should it be centralized? I think the consumer always has to be in control of their data and their insights, and should be empowered to use that accordingly. Bit like locking away your Facebook account. Thank you, Stuart, former lender. A uh, question for Justin and maybe Tim. How much of a responsibility is on lenders for financial education? And, and how can lenders go better about doing that? Yeah, thanks, Stu. Um, we, I guess we, we kind of touched on this a bit earlier, but I think there's a, you know, there's a full spectrum that, uh, as you said, the, the lender does, uh, is responsible, is a responsible lender at the point in time in which the consumer applies for a loan but there's a huge opportunity before the loan to get them in a position where they can uh, you know, compare different op options or where they can understand what is in front of them, what the difference between an offset and a redraw is, and simple terminology that many people actually don't understand. And so, I mean, that's a really an area that Flux is looking to fill with our, um, our Flux Enterprise product as well, which is a premium version of the Flux app. But um, you know, I think it's really important for lenders as well to take on some of that responsibility. And also, it's about the transparency information. So, I mean, most lenders do this well, and but in terms of the cost of that facility over a period of time, what that is, the so simple things about giving that transparency to the consumer. There may be some population base that may come on to the platform, be whatever lender that is, but may not have a huge amount of financial literacy. So that would come certain surprises in certain fees, charges, etc. So I think if they have that transparency from the get-go, it's you know. Back to the response, the question on the, you know the responsibility. I think it's from there from the get go in terms of the the communication and the awareness that they're providing to the individual from the get go. Any more questions? All right. Who wants coffee? Who wants tea? Who wants a lemon delicious <laughs> cupcake? Because if you do, please thank our panel: Jackie, Justin, Tim, and Richard, for a great session.